All right, so this lecture I'm doing something a little bit different than I had originally intended. Um, I was going to have a bit of a topical lecture this time. I unfortunately did not make a recording of my last lecture, so there wasn't a video on the topic. As a result, I have very, very few submissions for that topic. So I'll do another professional game today instead. And I will point out, since I am recording this and I'm not muted this time, go me, that uh, the topic that I want for, I guess, probably this month, I can't imagine anyone sending enough uh, videos just a week's time to do it next time, but hopefully sometime this month I would like uh, to go over a specific topic that you guys are going to be sending in. Essentially, it is a game in where you are comfortable about a opening. Let's say... Uh, San Rense, Chinese, whatever. Just an opening you're very, very comfortable against. I want you to play against it. And I want you to submit a game of yourself playing against it and where you lose. And not just, you know, okay, I lost something in some corner or whatever, end of the game, oh well. No, I want you to, I want only games submitted where you lose that game. Um, in a way which you think you shouldn't have. For example, you know that, uh, let's say you're playing against the San Rinse, and you have books on the San Rinse, and you've attended lectures on the San Rinse. You know exactly how to play against the San Rinse. And yeah, the San Rinse being typically for an influence opening, let's say you lost the game because they had more influence than you've ever seen in a Go game before. So I want you to lose it. I want the games... Uh, where you've lost that in a manner which you feel that you shouldn't because you should have been able to prevent it since you're familiar on how to play against it. Now, I should also point out is I'm not doing that simply to laugh at you as I have had people suggest. I've had people suggest that all week. It's kind of starting to irritate me. I'm doing it because I'm trying to get a lecture on how we typically apply what we uh, are learning. And there's a few somewhat common um, misconceptions on how we actually apply what we're learning that I'm actually trying to structure a lesson over, which is why I'm doing that. So no, it's not to laugh at you. Your names will be hidden, anyone who sends the games. Where do you send the games? You can send them to akariatzoointernet.net, as I have just typed in the chat. And hopefully we will be going over that sometime this week. Or not this week, this month. Alright, that said, today we are not doing that. We are going over professional game. Uh, those of you who have studied professional games, attended my lectures, whatever, probably recognize the name Cho Cho Han. He's a very, very, very strong professional Korean Nindam, one of my favorites, and I think by the end of this game, might be one of your favorites as well. And I'm just gonna point this out, I'm quite surprised, I have zero dropped frames today. I am amazed so far. My video might actually turn out well, for a change. But, alright. Continuing on with the game, or beginning the game as the case is, we have normal openings, as you expect, from just about anything that I ever go over. Because unless I state ahead of time that I'm going over a very weird Fuseki, I'm probably not going to uh, just bring out a game where people are opening 6-4 or Tengen, for example. And some people are already recognizing the game. Alright, that's cool. I am on the lookout for Cross Fuseki, but it's got to be an interesting game with the Cross, because I do like the Cross. I really, really do. And I would be happy to go over a game like that. But yeah, some of them just aren't too interesting. And as Dubstep pointed out, he likes this game, I imagine you guys will too, because it is fairly aggressive. You can start out, you can already see that uh, it's fairly aggressive by the fact that Black did not simply choose to play Orthodox here and enclose, 
but he's already going to approach his opponent's 3-4 stone. Now this brings it up a very interesting uh, dilemma for white. Because he can respond to this. He can respond to it with pincers by playing almost whatever. I mean, there's really, really hard uh, to actually go wrong this early in the game. He can play just about anything. However, since black's 3-4 stone is also facing white stone, he can also approach that. So it's usually a little bit difficult to pincer uh, white stone in, the, in that particular case, since I'll go over that in a minute. Now, where was it? White does in fact choose to approach. And I'm going to undo this real quick just to show. The reason why it's typically a bit more difficult to pincer this particular stone is it's a lot easy, a lot easier for white to uh, attack this because he gets to jump out, for example, and let's say even a, a counter pincer, in which case he's not only attacking the one stone, as I might have mentioned before uh, in a couple of my other lectures, but they're also growing off of their corner, so they're doing two things at once which is why usually when we do have a 3-4 stone facing our opponent stone, we usually want to do something with it, either in close or uh, depending on the opposing corner, we might try to make some sort of uh, Chinese variation, mini or micro, things like that. Our attention is usually centered around that 3-4 stone. Since he approached, white has the option of approaching and making the game nicely complicated, which we see here, because the amount of possibilities on this board are insane. I mean, black could feasibly ignore all of this and approach. Black could respond in some fashion or another. Black could try to follow up and pressure the uh, lower left 3-4 stone. I mean, all of these are possible. So it's almost impossible to predict what Black is going to do here. Uh, in some instances, it just comes down to what do you feel comfortable doing. I'm going to have to look at one of your games then, Ranchan. Alright, so black sides the pincer, ensuring that we are going to be playing a very aggressive game. He's not going to timidly back off. He's going to put pressure uh, on white's approach. And this is where things get a little bit weird. Because black or white jumps out, as I mentioned in my other variation. Black obviously defends the corner, not to get surrounded. But instead of attacking the stone, like I mentioned uh, earlier, as a possible variation, white decides... Mm, close. White does decide to pincer, but he's pincering far. This seems like a rather deliberate choice. There are a few reasons why we can see uh, how he picked this particular uh, move. And in the interest of not destroying the tree, I'll mention it in a minute. However, Black is now left with a series of questions. Does he lean on uh, the 3-4 stone? thus helping his c5 stone? Does he help his m4 stone and ensure that that counterattack variation, which we saw here, is never going to be played? Or does he do something completely different and play the th uh, approach the 4-4? A lot of different questions that Black has to ask himself now. 
and it looks like we've got a few people who have uh, pretty good ideas. I'm seeing more, I think all comments now pointing that black should do something on the bottom. Why should black do something on the bottom? Anyone uh, have any suggestions as to why they want black to play there? Black doesn't want two weak groups, that's correct. Right, I'm liking the answer so far. There's one little itty bitty reason why I also like it. But I might not get it. You are correct. You are correct in what you've mentioned so far. Though it does also bear mentioning that uh, this C5 stone is not in any danger of suddenly being killed even if white gets another move against it, because white pincered so far away. I mean, the most that we can follow it up with is either a diagonal, the attachment, or the kick. And in all three instances, black can still settle, or can still get out. In order to kill this off, these are the three moves that white needs to play. Until then, there is still Aji back here. So if white really wants to spend the next three moves killing off one stone, black is not going to be upset about that. More so because as we see in the actual game, and as you guys have suggested, black is settling here on the bottom, ensuring that if white does get those extra moves, well, okay, the, the stone might be dead, but the influence from this is already being negated because we're having a nice little group uh, right where he wants to use that influence. So for a bunch of different reasons, the bottom side is definitely the more attractive side here. There was one thing I was going to go back and mention, what was it? I have no idea. If, for example, uh, black had chosen to lean on the stone, we can pretty easily figure out how that's going to play out. And now we have a question, is what is all of this influence doing? I mean, do we stop pushing now? And potentially go away? Let uh, white come up later? That would be bad, because M4 is now in trouble, and white's getting a lot of territory, and we still have not any real good idea as to how these black stones are going to settle, or not settle, but use the influence they're obtaining. Uh, do we keep pushing and try and connect up here? I mean, I, I guess we can, but white's going to be fine. So white can go back and play another move, because white can still get out. White would still be able to potentially settle here. I mean, white could just say you're never using that influence, and maybe play a larger move. In which case, you're now left as black to decide how are you using that huge wall you just created. That would be a little bit of an annoying thing to have to decide. Because there's no real easy way of doing it. So black simply settles on the bottom, says you can have those stones. You need a lot of them if you want to kill it. And I can live whenever I want. So white says, no, I'm not going to I'm not gonna just spend all that effort. I'm going to kick you. If you want to run away, then we'll deal with that variation instead. And thus, black has a very interesting decision on his hands. Because if we're kicked, what is the most natural response? Okay, uh, interesting response. Play elsewhere if we are kicked. Odd. Um, D5 is the one I was looking for, though. Thank you. Most natural response is to stand up and defend. However, if we are standing up and defending, and we know that we can't live locally because we are pincered here, the question becomes, where is this stone going to go? One quick idea is that it's going to settle. Or not settle, connect, sorry. 
and we can see where it can connect. Unfortunately, there's a chance that the shoulder hit is going to be played by white, cutting off our connection if we decide to play that heavy. So instead, black plays light. And so far this game is actually turning fairly straightforward. Right? I mean, we can kind of follow what's going on pretty easily. Black says, if I'm not careful, you can develop a large side here on the bottom. I'm going to make certain you can't. White's trying to induce Black to run, so he can still try and split and get a nice little attack on those two stones. So Black says, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just try to sacrifice that. and see where we go from here. Now, in the game, white plays this. I should warn you, however, that a lot of people's first response is to actually extend here, which is almost always what black wants you to do. And the reason being is that there's so many forcing moves that they're going to be very, very happy as they get a fairly nice shape here. I mean, you're going to be kept on the third line here. You have an option to get an extra stone, but not too much more than that. Whereas Black's getting some influence, he's connecting up his stones, has really, really easy time of making a shape here. So Black's fairly happy with this result. Whereas the as, uh, as Element C point out, the empty triangle, we tend to kind of side away from a bit more. But there are instances, like we're seeing here, where it's actually a fairly good move. And now Black has another choice on his hands. Do we connect up our stones again? Do we keep trying to sacrifice them? What are we going to do? I mean, it is an empty triangle. Empty triangle is, in of itself, a bit of a bad shape. We could try and go aggressive here. What do you think? Do we just throw off uh, C5? Do we play elsewhere? Do we try and connect up because the empty triangle's got its problems? Sacrifice and settle bottom in Sente. That is a very peaceful solution. You are must be a peaceful player. E6. Alright, that's the same idea. So we're going for peace so far. Uh, probably E5, more peaceful ideas. Black bottom is fine, so he can tanuki. Interesting choice. Um, E4 has been damaged a bit, though, by getting hit here. But, I mean, I guess it's true that uh, black can be fine. The hane is kind of huge, though, at E5, if you let white get it in. So black says it's time to attack here. knowing full well that we're going to get caught, because no one, no one, no one, no one, no one, no one, not a 10Q, I'm going to say not, a, not even a 15Q, will probably look at this and not cut it. It's just so inviting. I don't think I've ever met anyone who would avoid that. So clearly we know it's coming. But there are problems with uh, the empty triangle. If we descend, we can see that this has three liberties. So those ha that hane is huge. So you've got to be careful. Oh god, no lyrics. So white has, a, a, has to take that into consideration. He only has three liberties here. If he does not hane, for example, and let's say he decides to, I don't know, uh, I have no idea, extend, for example. Why not? 
what happens when we hane? Are we going to respond with a hane? And then get Atari? And connect, I guess? And somehow hope this isn't going to result in us getting killed in the corner? That would be not good. Uh, do we instead drop down? Might be an interesting choice if this one stone wasn't present. But the yeah, corner's open, so black can still come in. The question again becomes, how is this doing anything? So what plays a Hane? It's the only move that he can play. Otherwise, his corner is in a lot of trouble. In the interest of not losing his stones, black responds. And now we see a very aggressive variation. Black tries to look after his outside stones, and white tries to look after his cutting stones. Very, very basic. Cutting stones are important, so we know we're going to save those. Otherwise, why did we play this variation? Uh, Black doesn't want to lose his stones, so he's making them stronger as well. But Black gets really aggressive here, and tries to fight. Now, here's a question for you. Let's see how well you can read this out, and one dons, wait a few seconds before responding. So I know you know this immediately. Where is black going to play if white defends the corner? No, element C. I know that you know this. I know the one dons know this. Looking for a Q response first, to see if they're on the same page as the rest of us. Any ideas there? B no, okay. Um, you're a little bit confused, Professor. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that, yeah. Well, I'm assuming that White defends the corner immediately. So that he's completely and utterly alive in the corner. The question then is, where would Black play? Where would his follow-up be? And it looks like we're getting it immediately. Um, ooh, Ron, who said that? Yeah, Ron Chan. Uh, same idea, but you're not being aggressive enough because you're not taking into consideration what B5 really means. The answer, yeah, you're, you're all uh, quite correct. E7. We get to go ahead and push here and apply so much pressure to these cutting stones. I mean, if that actually occurred, we're going to be doing what as white here? just kind of trying to run this way and connect up while black gets this enormous wall here. That's probably game ending right there. You can probably lose this game from that exchange if you're not careful. Because all of that influence is just going to immediately come down on this stone that's now way too close to it. So that's going to have to live. These stones here had to live. If black actually gets stronger, then these two stones are going to have to go back and live. So from that one decision to defend the corner here, and let black push out, you're going to have to give up your two stones. If you save them, you're screwed. Such a seemingly small decision, but it would have enormous impacts for the rest of the game. Instead, white says, you know what, I, I, I can't do that. If I defend, I'm dead. So he moves to keep black in. A much more aggressive move. Yep, there is a peep already. And if I haven't mentioned it now, I will. I haven't mentioned it yet, rather, I should do it now, and point out that yes, this game is a little bit violent. The last lecture I had, I was stupid, I did not realize I was muted the entire freaking time, so I was not able to actually save the video. So it's kind of a continuation of that. We have a nice, very wonderfully violent game in store for us today. So yes, we're going to get peeped, and again, it's 
is anyone going to be surprised if white pushes, if black pushes through? Probably not. Probably not. So black pushes. And so does white. Empty triangle again, backing off. White connects, and it looks like white's in a lot of trouble here. So many cut points. Again, do you know anyone who's going to resist pushing through this? Of course you don't. So it's going to push. White's going to block. Now we've got a potential double Atari uh, staring us in the face. White's obvi Black's obviously going to go for it. Again, another Atari. But here's the question. Why isn't this immediate game over for White? Ooh, I like Smochi's idea. You guys are all on the same page that we can do that, but I like that Smochi wants to do it immediately. I so like that. That's that's the good thought right there. Immediately playing the Atari is so much better than Atariing the uh, uh, F6 stone in and of itself. Yeah, don't help Black. Let him decide if he wants to Atari you, if he wants to take that stone, whatever. Black takes. White takes. We're still not a very strong group yet. We're a little bit stronger now here as Black. Not completely strong. So he comes up. Mm -hmm. White takes a bit of a lead here now because of this. Now one, uh, I don't want to say a mistake. I, I can't in all good conscience call it a mistake. But one thing that I would expect to see here from uh, a lot of perhaps cute players is to now say, all right, this is strong. I'm going to use it to attack and throw a stone back in here and pincer, and try to uh, pincer white stones. The only trouble with that is... Yeah, trouble with this is the uh, two different things here. One, this group is not unconditionally alive yet. It's still in trouble if white actually gets uh, out into the middle. And the bottom is already uh, having a few problems as being pointed out in the chat, it's not in a strong position here yet. I mean, they've got uh, giant holes here and a little bit of a white wall. Got to be careful. So what you have here is a uh, bottom that's not strong. You've got the left group, which isn't strong. And then you would have this new stone that's being created wherever you're going to try to pincer that also has to run out and live somewhere. So you would have three things to worry about. White would have one, just that weak group you're trying to attack. So white would be very, very happy. Recognizing this, black just says, I'm going to make myself stronger. I cannot afford to pincer you right now. I know that leads to danger. So right away, completely different game if we did not realize that. If we did not realize that and pincer, then it might look good for one move, but in the future, we're going to see all of those three problems come up. And we're going to regret this in uh, later on in review. So black comes up. White defends. Y yeah, D13 is also probably the worst move to pick there. That is true. Just throwing a stone down in the middle of nowhere and hoping it lives. <laughs> All right, yes, you're right, D10 would be worse. 
but all right. Cat Black, lean on P3 stones now. Baduk Blood. Hmm, why do I feel like I know that name from somewhere? Oh, right, oh, right. Never mind. Continuing on. Uh, you are right, though. Leaning on the P3 stones is exactly uh, what you can do here now as black, because we have, uh, looking around the board, assessing the situation, what's uh, strong, what's weak, what's large. We can see in terms of weak groups, the only one that white has that's uh, weak right now is these two stones. We could play elsewhere, but then that would give white a chance to make himself stronger, to go back and attack, to do really whatever he wants to do. So black's going to use his sente to try and poke these two stones, see what he can do. Uh, what? Q8? Okay, so you're looking, all right, that's looking to uh, profit on the right-hand side by attacking the wall. Okay, that's, that's an interesting idea. Black is a little bit more aggressive and tries to cut through the small knight, or the two spaces engine, rather. Because the reason why we play the one space extension over the two is because this actually gives us potential to uh, do something against this uh, two space jump here. And when deciding the similar situation, you know, which one you're going to do, that is how, uh, essentially, one of the ways that you can come up to that decision. Are you going to try and cut that at some point later, unless white fixes himself? Well, if you have that in mind and you want to go through with that, then maybe play the uh, one space jump instead. If you're just interested in territory, okay, maybe make the two space. Uh, many. So yes, black tries to cut through, and immediately we have another uh, answer which involves completely upon reading. And that's the attachment. We're going to try to get stronger. Oh, did someone, did someone suggest this? I mean, we got to laugh. Uh, no, okay. Essentially, you're attaching to your opponent. He's probably going to respond, especially since the bottom is weak. Is already weak, I should say. So he does. Cuts available. Going to protect. Which allows white to respond. Now we can't cut, otherwise we're going to get killed. So black uses uh, brain crash a suggestion. Q8, good suggestion. We can potentially uh, surround this area, especially if we get a move like A in. That's kind of large. Threatening to completely surround this and take that whole right that uh, right side. That's good. White makes himself some shape. Since Black's getting stronger in the area, he can't remain uh, having Aji behind. Mhm. Mm Black takes Sente. Oops, sorry. Uh, Q3? What's Q3? Oh, defending the corn. Hmm. 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 It's... Uh, Q3 kind of strikes me as a small move. And if you play Q3, white's going to what? Q2? I guess. Anyway, black takes Sente here, plays a large move. If white wants to play in the corner, that's fine. Black will take another large move on the top of the board. Doesn't care. 
But now White has a very interesting decision to make. Because he's clearly has he clearly has something now. So what is he gonna do? Is he gonna continue to settle with his group? Is he going to take territory? Is he going to invade? Is there some sort of large point on top we can still take for ourselves? Or Or, as um, we can see from this, that there is in fact a small knight here, we can get in a bit of a forcing move, can't we? Or we can try again a bit of a forcing move by threatening to cut it. Interesting choice. Because that's the one slight little problem with the little small knights. They can be cut and everyone knows it. However, there's another problem here. And that is these two groups. White isn't 100% alive yet. So what is black going to do? He's going to make certain... That his other group is not going to be 100% uh, alive yet either. Well, it might not be cut. It really depends on... Let's go and play something else. It really depends on what your answer is going to be to this. Because if you're going to play something like here, for example, then you're allowing this to connect on up, and we're cut. If you're... Uh, what else can we do? Um, if we Atari, then again we might get cut. Um, I guess we could play this way and now we're not going to get cut, but this is really, really passive. And we're still, I guess, going to get cut. So, no really good follow-ups if we play elsewhere. Uh, I guess it, whoops, not that. Um, you go back to uh, you, thank you. I mean, I guess there's this. This is a pretty strong reply. Kick and then pinch. Ah, yeah. That's the normal response. To go ahead and kick this. Though, I don't think we'd want a pincer here because the connection is too easy. I think here, white, uh, black's idea is to just follow this up. Wow, did I just destroy the tree? I did. Awesome! Oh well, 50 moves in before I did it. Good enough. So black pincers, white doesn't just jump out. White decides, since he does recognize it is still a little bit weak there, he's going to gain strength from the nearby group of blacks. The one that's not involved in this fight, which is the bottom. And this is fairly weak. It looks like there's going to be a good, I don't know how many forcing moves, at least two? that he can get by uh, forcing White to defend himself. Might find a few more over on the left if he really, really needs them. So he can make a fair bit of shape here before he decides to uh, actually commit himself with this stone. White act... Black actually comes up, connecting. White follows. Groups connected. Okay. Now white comes out. Black separates, as we expect, so we don't want these two groups ever connecting. I mean, even if you don't understand why you should do it, one really good thing that you should do in your games is if you see two things that aren't completely alive yet, just 
make certain they can't connect and see what that gives you. Just experiment with it in your game. See what happens. Even if you fully can't read out what that's going to get you, why you're doing it, you'll understand if you play in your games. So White doesn't want to keep moving against this stone, because he's going to completely surround it if he does. So White jumps out. So Black gets to attack the other group. Okay. This looks fairly horrifying for White. I mean, he's pincered, he can't run out the way he wants to. There's now a two-stone wall there. All he can do is move out this way, I suppose. And again, same thing. Black's going to keep separation. So I guess White just has to jump out this way, which means Black gets to take solid points here. The corner is pretty uninvadable at this point. And we're still not completely settled yet, so we have to continue running away. Mm-hmm. And you're going to say that Black wins in, in the end. Excellent recommendation, or guess, or whatever. That is what I was assuming when I reviewed this game as well. I made the exact same thought as you did. It's like, alright, there's just weak groups everywhere. There's no way that white is going to be able to come out of this fine. So white goes back and kicks, or black goes back and kicks, makes certain that there's no Aji there to uh, settle this. I'm just saying I was on the same page as you. Okay, right, so responding to this is no good. It's Gote. So White comes out as well. Because he doesn't want to uh, get attacked here again. Because that would suck. If White actually drops down here, and Black just gets to keep attacking, he's going to take the entire side and there's nothing you can do about it. At that point, you might as well just resign. The game has quite literally just been lost. I don't think you can recover from this. You can push through P9, sure, but you're almost completely surrounded, right? Even if you did this. This is looking kind of hideous. And even after all of that, there's still Aji here, yeah? So even after you do or don't keep him surrounded, you're going to be able to cut through this, and it's just white dying all over the place. So white comes out, very, very important move, cannot let black get that by any means. And that's what this game is, uh, one of the reasons why I picked it. There's so many instances where we can clearly see, oh, if he doesn't play this move, he's going to lose. That sounds really, really obvious and stupid now that I just said it. That sounded a lot better in my head before I actually said the words. Um, I think you know what I mean. Yeah, that sounded really bad. It's like, really? And in what game do you play that if you don't make a move, you're not going to lose? Yeah, I can't think of one. But it's just really obvious that everything is kind of, uh, yeah, I guess as M NMC had mentioned, it's really on an edge. And if one person makes one slow move, the game just suddenly avalanches in their favor. And that's why I, sent, why I found this game really interesting. So Black goes back and attacks the bottom group. I mean, one of them's out. So what are we going to do? We're going to go back and clean our glasses. That's what we're going to do, because I just smudged them. That is a good idea. And in the interest of continuing this game, I have to be able to see. There we go. So in the interest of uh, uh, keeping pressure, one group got out. We're going to attack the other one. Stands to reason. So, white's got to connect. 
black separates. And who would actually expect that white has a chance in this game still? Is everyone pretty much on the page that we're all kind of thinking that this game is over? No, it's not a spoiler, but of blood. I'm just wondering if you think white should resign now. Good point from Ron Chan. Black does not have much territory. Stops. The top still looks possible to make points on. Yeah, for white. I mean, black is keeping separate, uh, keeping the group separated nicely. This is interesting. This is an interesting little trap. We can't really cut through there as much as we might like to. So black gets to connect. Or white gets to connect. Someone does anyway. He's not completely surrounded. So white moves to kill the bottom stones. Since... Keep in mind, back when we shoulder hit, black did not connect up. Tries to cut through, white connects. And now is a question, can we really get those stones out of there? Maybe, maybe not, huh? Getting rid of liberties, even threatening some eye shape, all in sente. Oops, d d growl. Before going back and uh, making the cut. And now we have a wonderful question on our hands. Is this life? Is this death? Is it Seki? What is this? Okay, I've got one vote for Seki. Two votes for Seki. All right. You are correct in the assumption that this is dead. White would actually win this by one liberty. So black sacrifices and gets really, really strong. So the question is, where is the compensation going to come from? What can we possibly do here? Well, very, very good question. What, what did we get from this? We got a uh, stronger group here. We've got some shape that's pretty well indestructible now. I mean, this is about as solid as you can get in the middle. Yeah, it's black. Where's the compensation? This is about as uh, strong group as we can possibly ask for in the center. So there's that. So I guess since we're strong in the middle, I guess we do have this white group that's still not entirely settled, so black attacks. The whole thing. Doesn't try to cut it up into pieces. He's going to try to cut, he's going to attack the entire group. White makes some emergency moves. Sente, always looking for Sente. Trying to get shape. Black tries to ruin the shape. Anything and everything in order to settle. Because you know, you might have heard before that you're not supposed to attach to weak stones. 
uh, or not to attach to the opponent's stones, rather, just in general, and now we're seeing him do it pretty much with his every move, because he's looking for anything that Black has to respond to, because he knows that this would be too much if he loses it. So anything that your opponent has to respond to that's getting you a little bit stronger is pretty much what is what he's playing. Just throw the kitchen sink at him. Whatever you have, he needs to make shape. So anything that's forcing, he's trying to use. And slowly but surely, it looks like we're actually getting some shape. But this is a very important question. What do we do against the Atari here? Do we actually play the Ko? We do have threats now, so white's going to play it. That's huge. That is an enormous co. Now, would it surprise any of you if I say this co is never played? Very huge co. We can, as people have already mentioned, there's a snapback to connect. Assuming the co is one. Black, on the other hand, decide, or what, decides to do something a bit different, and no one's going to understand why. White is playing the Atari. And pushing. And then connecting. Go ahead, try and wrap your brains around it. What was the point of any of that. Because to many people, you're probably looking at that and saying, you know what, I, 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 I see what White was going for. White decided that he, he was his stones were probably going to die, so it would be a really, really great idea to give as many friends to the dead stones as possible, that way, although they're dead, they're not lonely. Because if all of those stones are dead, then why did we just do this? White plays the Atari, or black plays the Atari. It took me forever to figure that one out too there, Brain Crash. And I'm still not entirely certain that I'm right and that he actually realized what he had here. But it mounts to two different things. Aji in two different areas, which we're going to see very, very shortly. And I'm still not 100% that he simply was misreading. But alright, white takes, because white doesn't want to die. I'm thinking that's time Suji. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking too. So here's the question. What are we going to do now as black? Well, there's a little bit of a cut here. I'm going to mark it so you can actually see. You can't see my mouse. There's a bit of a cut here. So there's some Aji and there's, some, there's, there's a cut here that you really can't do much with. Combined, it looks like there's forcing moves. So Black says, you know what, this is my... This is all mine. There's going to be no Aji remaining. Nothing to work against, those stones are just dead. The whole right side is mine. So White squeezes on into the corner. Getting a fairly large... Uh, potential corner for himself there. But something that we really need to pay attention to is all of his agitus remaining. And he must have read this immediately. That if he, this stone actually gets connected up and black has to connect up, 
then that clamp is very interesting, and we're going to be seeing it in a moment. For now, white's alive, so it's going to keep separating uh, other black stones. Black plays the Hane. And now we're getting some value from our stones. They're not quite dead yet. Black doesn't want these to live. So he's got to respond. And he's got to respond. Same deal. Forcing moves. Forcing moves because we're going to be needing a base up top. So that's got to be responded to. And then black plays here. Very, very unusual move. But we can kind of see that if black played anything else, there is Aji here. Right? I mean, how are we going to respond to this move? Probably not this way. Because now we don't even know if we can survive this. And probably not this way. For the same reason. We can't Hane. Again with the throw in, same thing. What happens now? I guess the only answer is to play down. And now we're getting into a bit of a capture race. Now, some people are questioning why that move and not uh, that move. Still has O12? What? Where is O12? There we go. Yes, he's taking endgame into consideration. Yep. Very good. Even though I'm horrible at endgame, I know this. <laughs> endgame, if white gets it, we have to respond. So that's sente for white. By playing here, not going to be sente for white. I just ruined the tree again. Sweet! So yeah, Sente for white, and now we managed to sacrifice these stones somewhat strategically because this group is, is now in trouble. So white puts pressure on it. Time Suji. And then attaches, in, the same sim uh, in a similar situation we saw a minute ago from White, all he wanted to do was get Shape to live. Pretty much the same thing. We're looking for the exact same thing here. We need to not die in the upper left quarter of the board. That's Black's goal. White plays the Hane. Thinking that uh, Black probably assumed that White was going to just extend. Instead, white plays a Hane, which allows black to Hane, and now we're kind of fighting over these four stones on the bottom, or on the left. So now we're getting into another dilemma. Do we try and connect up, or do we keep trying to kill the top? White says, I'm going to keep trying to kill the top. That's a very bold decision to make, because it also means our four stones uh, kind of sort of just died without a fight. Because there's no way we can connect those up. So a little bit of an exchange there. The left for the top. White keeps corner. Black asks if there's any Aji here. Certainly none in the corner. Forcing, can I connect? No, not really. No, there's four, three, three is not going to work. Uh, 
Same thing, is there any Aji? No, there is not. So he just takes his territory in the bottom right. Because up until now, that uh, S3 stone was playable. That's fairly large. Now it's White's turn to ask, is there any Aji here? Black says no, I'm going to connect, I've got eyes, you don't, this is easy. It's like, alright, fine. Guess there's nothing there. Takes a stone. Once again, asks about Aji. Black simply kills. Now there's nothing there. Not quite to end game, no. Forcing move, definitely large, worth a couple of points. Same thing here, can't connect, definitely gonna respond. This game's actually going to end in a minute, believe it or not. The game actually ends right here. And the reason why it ends is, although it is kind of close, I think it's worth, and by close I mean like amateur standards of close, as in I think it's within about 10 points, the score does favor white. I think even the score estimator would probably be able to tell that, though. Let me check that out. Alright, nope, score estimator is horribly confused. Alright, that's why we like the score estimator. <laughs> uh, sadly, white is not, or black is not, 50 points ahead. So, very, very, very violent game. And even if the ending, you kind of lost track of really what was going on, I think the beginning, uh, it was pretty clear to see how one move essentially could have immediately changed the entire game. It's like you don't respond and suddenly I get everything going in my way and you're going to have to resign. That they were actually, uh, as mentioned earlier, they were really walking this really, really tight edge where one slow move means the end of everything. And although it's very, very aggressive and somewhat complicated, I think everyone was able to follow along and hopefully also enjoyed this game. On that note, I want to mention... Ooh, I only had 610 drop frames this time. That's not bad at all. Uh, on that note, I want to mention again, uh, sometime this month, I'm going to be having a themed lecture provided uh, by you guys in where... Yeah, sorry about the spoilers. Uh, where hopefully you guys are going to send in games where you lost a game that you thought you understood very, very well. Like if you understand how to play against Sanrin, say, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, for example, and your opponent wins by getting essentially the most amount of influence you've ever seen before, I do want to go and review those kind of games in the lecture. Because there's a lot of uh, cases where we are trying to learn something and everyone kind of makes almost the same mistake on how they're actually applying what they're learning. I'm trying to go and have a lecture essentially on that. And I think doing it this way might be kind of fun for everyone. But yeah, whether you know how to play against San Rensei, Chinese Fuseki, either high or low, whether you're, you think you're really, really knowledgeable about uh, you know, how to do with a mini or micro Chinese, orthodox, whatever, if you find a game where suddenly you were just putting all of that information to shame and begin really doubting if you know how to play against these openings at all, send it in. I want to review it. And once again, you can email them to me. Ah. You can email them to me at akarget.zoominternet.net. And I'll be more than happy to go ahead and look at those. 
So on that note, thank you everyone for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed this game as much as I did. And I will see you guys again week after next. Until then, I hope everyone takes care.